so um, from here, what I want you to do is like right click on this link that says Code for Hands-On Workshop Fall 2018 and just open that in a new window. Um, you should see a GitHub page like this. And if you use, sorry, like this. If you use GitHub, you'll probably know how to pull this repo down. If you don't use GitHub that much, just click on this green button. You'll get a drop down menu. And then you can click download zip. And it will download all of the code that we're going to use today. You can put it anywhere you want. And you can open that up as a project in your R Studio as you see fit. Um, but the reason why we're, the main reason why we're going to do that is because once you do that, and I'll do that with you, um, I want to run this patch package program first. Um, now, as I do that, let me just note that um, what that's going to do is ensure that you have all the libraries that we're going to use today. And if there's something, some concern, that this should not cause any problems on your computer. But if you have some concern about the versions of the packages you're running, maybe you don't want to run this. Although I would find that really strange. I can't imagine why that would be the case. But I feel like I'm kind of honor bound to at least mention to you that it's going to update some packages possibly. So from this uh, expanded view of what we just downloaded, you can double click on the map-fall2018, which is the project file, the R project file. And even if you're on a Windows or a PC, that should, or, or a Mac, it should um, launch you straight into a project in RStudio, which will allow you to have, um, I don't know if you use projects in RStudio, but the nice thing about projects in RStudio is it allows you to reference all of your data and your scripts from a relative position. Um, in other words, you don't have to have these really long working directory paths, and you don't have to use the setwd function, which, um, to be fair, is not particularly reproducible. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we promote it. Um, so I'm going to launch, I'm going to open this 00 path and package.rmd file. And uh, the easiest thing to do from this point um, is to just click the green arrow right here in the first one that says the following packages enable code in the workstation, in the workshop. Um, so I'm going to run that. And while we're talking, it's going to do its thing. And then I'm going to run a different one on my machine, because my machine needs some other patches since we're in the lab. All right. So uh, the first student who walked in, and I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, um, I said, by law of probabilities, I'm betting that you're a grad student in the Nicholas School, and he agreed that he was. Um, so we're a little smaller group than I was expecting, but I'm going to still bet that there's another grad student in the Nicholas School in this room. Is there? And there we go, three of them. And you're either public policy or medicine or engineering. Nope, wrong on all three. Oh, well. Can't do so well in probabilities when you only have an N of equals four. But um, grad student? Undergrad. Oh, great. And what's your project, just out of curiosity? Uh, I'm in bio, and I'm working on a uh, project. Super. Oh, yeah. We, um, there's an interesting visualization in our lab that, have you ever, mm -hmm. you probably, have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah, it's really kind of cool. Um, so uh, that visualization, just to bring everybody else up to speed, um, takes satellite images and has a before and after of mountaintop removal. Um, and how that's changed the landscape, and it's really quite fascinating. Um, right, so I'm going to launch from here. I'm going to go back to this page, and I'm going to um, just take a look at the slides. Now, I will say up front that I am actually much more of an R enthusiast than I am. I'm definitely not a geographer. Uh, I know how to make a lot of maps and do some geospatial analysis in R. Uh, but if your question gets moderately advanced, that's when Mark's going to show back up. Mark is our GIS specialist. So there's plenty about GIS that I don't know. Um, but it uh, should not be a problem. Um, in any way, this class is mostly introductory. Um, but if we need to move farther 
along in a particular question of yours, that's when I would encourage you to either make an appointment or come see me in my open office hours. Um, and if I didn't say it, I usually work on Wednesdays from 1 to 3 in the open, in the lab. Uh, so this is part of the R Fund series. We do workshops on other things in R as well as other topics. Uh, but primarily today we're going to cover um, mapping and it's really handy to have some sense of what, how the tidyverse works and how ggplot works in order to take this workshop. If you don't, it's no big deal. You can look in these background resources and sort of catch yourself up later. Um, one of my other colleagues, one of the other GIS specialists, Drew Keener, um, was really keen on calling this mapping as opposed to GIS um, because he had a strong sense that um, we weren't actually doing any particular analysis. And I, while I think that's debatable, it's certainly light on the analysis. Um, but the point being, the real point of this slide and, and Drew's comment is that um, to some degree, doing your spatial analysis in R is still relatively new. The behemoth application in the mapping GIS space is ArcGIS. Um, which is a proprietary tool, um, and it's free on campus, but it's not going to be free when you get out into the world. Um, there is an open source um, sort of cousin to that called QGIS that a lot of people use, and you may find that there are lots of people, more people using those tools than are for mapping. But, um, and if you're really on the lighter side, Tableau probably, or if you're a programmer, you could also use Python, um, but we're going to focus on R. Specifically, these three packages in bold, Leaflet, Tidy Census, and SF, um, but there are a couple other packages listed there that we're going to end up using. There are some more advanced packages for mapping um, that we are not going to use, but it might be useful to you to reference these slides and know that these other packages exist. Uh, the one that jumps out at me is Raster. Um, I don't personally do any raster analysis, but if you are one of those people, you're probably going to end up using that package. So we're going to jump right in. Um, we're going to do three things. We're going to make an XY plot where we're just plotting latitude and longitude uh, on a grid. We're going to use a tool called Tidy Census to create a choropleth. And then and a choropleth is basically a thematic map. And then we're going to go beyond Tidy Census to do some more fine-grained control of um, our thematic map. All right, so uh, I hope this is not too basic for you, but I never know who's showing up. So this particular map is what we're going to create next. Um, in our case, it really consists of just two layers, all right? Uh, the layer that we're adding on top are all the little blue markers, which are the XY coordinates, the latitude and longitude. It has a base layer, which is really a conglom conglomerate layer, right? There's a layer if you look at that base layer closely, you can see that there's a road layer. There's a labels layer, for example, where you get Durham and there's uh, Chapel Hill. There's, a, there's a, clearly a water layer where you get waterways. And there appears to be some land characteristics in the green. Um, and I don't know what the gray is, but there's clearly a whole conglomeration of layers that's packaged up as one single base layer. And so that's really nice. It's a real convenience. Um, but you don't always get that base layer. It depends on how you end up visualizing your map. Um, but it, I wanted to point that out because one of the sort of central ideas, not only of um, GIS visualizations, but visualiza visualizations in general, is that you have these layers that you build up on top of each other. So we're going to end up doing that. If anybody here has used ggplot, um, you're familiar with the idea of layering your images. Okay. All right, so uh, jumping right in, let's go to uh, our downloaded um, files in our studio and I need to run one more package and while that's running we're going to open up um, the O1 file called o1georeference.rmd and I will uh, just as soon as I can I will expand the font on this so it's easier for you to see um, tools, tools, global options, appearance. Now, it's always kind of a luck of the draw on fonts when you're putting them through the projector 
So some audience participation will be helpful there. Is that font large enough for you? Okay, and I can change the, con the con you know, I can make it a dark screen if the contrast is not right. But just let me know if it's difficult to see, we can change it. So um, the particular sort of tidyverse coding style that we're using here is called um, literate coding. Works really well um, with this R markdown method. Um, I'm not leveraging all of that, but there's a workshop on R markdown and, and uh, literate coding if you want to learn more. But what it allows you to do is have these things that are called code chunks, which are surrounded by prose, where you provide more literate commentary on what you're doing. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, if we just execute this first code chunk, is just make sure that we have the two libraries we need, Tidyverse and Leaflet. And then we're going to go down here and we're going to load some data from the um, data directory. And this data that we're loading in is uh, all the Starbucks locations in the US in 2012. Then down here at line 26, uh, we're going to run this, ex we're going to execute this code chunk, and we can take a quick look at this data frame. I'm just going to pop this out to make it even yet a little bit easier to see. You don't have to do this. Um, but here's our data frame of Starbucks information. And the thing that we're really interested in, actually, is the latitude and longitude and the name, right? The name vector is right there, and it's just the name of each um, store. And if we scroll over, this data set actually is sort of a almost an embarrassment of riches when it comes to being able to geolocate. Because under location, we have not only a full street address, but we have latitude and longitude there. And then if you keep on going, uh, it still has street and everything broken out into its own fields. And then it has coordinates, latitude and longitude. And then it actually has latitude and longitude broken out. So this almost never happens in real life, right? Usually your data is far harder to pull together. In um, It just so happens that this works really well for a workshop. And if you need help um, wrangling your data, we're happy to help you. But this is the data that we're going to really want to grab, is this latitude and longitude columns. So that's the Starbucks NC. That's this data frame right here. And the first thing we're going to do is send it to Leaflet. These pipes say and then. That's the tidyverse style. And then I'm going to stop right here and just run these first three lines, um, which I'm going to do by highlighting and hitting Control Enter. And uh, what you see here really is a very general base map, right? If I zoom in. This is the leaflet base map, and as I zoom in, it should be no surprise, I'm getting more detail, right? So um, I can also set the view and set the zoom by adding the fourth line. So I'm going to control enter on that. And so the view, uh, there's a number of different ways. If you look at the help, let me pop this back in for just a second. Set view. I'm going to highlight set view, and on my machine, I'm going to hit F1. I'm sure there is a Mac equivalent to that, but I don't know what it is. Um, but hitting F1 opens the um, documentation for this particular library. And set view will tell you that there's a number of ways that you can set the view, right? So that's how you can learn more. But back to our code. Oops. Let me just run these four, four again. Control Enter. Um, so we're setting our latitude and longitude to make a, a binding box that will define what the window is, and we're also setting the zoom. And then the very last thing we're going to do, um, taking from this data frame up here, we're simply identifying under Add Markers. And again, in the F1 Help, if you look over here, um, add markers. There are a ton of different ways of markers that you can add tiles, you can add uh, circle markers, you can add circles, you can add rectangles. The list goes on. So it's good to know about all of those. We're just going to add basic markers where we identify the latitude with the latitude in our data frame and the longitude with the longitude in our data frame. 
And I'm switching my syntax here just so you can see that there are different ways to do it. But I'm also taking my pop-up and identifying that in my data frame as the vector name, right? So just to bring that home a little bit, um, here's the vector name in the Starbucks NC. And that pop-up function does probably what you imagine. So I'm going to run this one more time. And so I've got my latitude and longitude markers actually automatically set. And if I click on any one of them, that's where I get my pop-up. And of course, that pop-up gives you a lot of control over um, what you put in there, but it's stuff that you would have in your data frame to begin with. All right? Um, all right, so that's step one. And what I'd like to do now is take five minutes or less, um, and we can decide as a group. Um, go back to your Files tab and open this file that says exercise one, xyleaflet.rmd. Um, I covered it so briefly that I forgot that I didn't say more about it. Um, let me, so where is that? It's over here. So it's really just a um, shortcut. It's the same as saying Starbucks NC dollar. Um, and you could do either one, right? Like I could, I, instead of the tilde, I could put this here. And instead of this, I can put the tilde, and that will still work. And I, I just put that there so you are aware that there are yeah, different yeah. ways. I guess just feel like generally in the T-Fire, you're like Python a few things, you don't need the tilde at all, just because it already knows I, it's looking in Starbucks NC. It yeah, it's, it's, it so should. I think I was trying that earlier, and it doesn't work. It's 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 I thought. Functions. I think it won't work, and I, yeah, it didn't. which is be, yeah. has something. I, I don't know if that's because yeah. it's um, leaflet. Or what? I mean, I just don't know. Because um, all it's doing is referring back to that, like you said, the, the file that you're piping in there. So yeah, it, should know, it, it should know. It should know. That's why. Totally Let's blame it on Leaflet because, I, you know, to, to have an undue amount of respect for the whole Tidyverse world, I'm going to say that if Tidyverse developed this, that you wouldn't have to do that. What part of the code actually adds the base name? Uh, it's a great question. We're going to cover that a little bit more, but um, it's this add tiles feature. And there are ways to, later in the workshop, we'll manipulate that base layer to choose a couple different ones. Um, and you can actually, it's also worth noting, if we just comment out that one line, um, then, you know, we're still plotting our XY. Uh, it's just not sure. But the context is harder to understand in this case. But going back to that concept of layering, you know, what if we didn't want that whole conglomerate base layer? We just wanted rivers. So we'd have to go out and find a river layer. And the two of those might make sense together. Probably not Starbucks and rivers, maybe highways and rivers. Hi highways and Starbucks would make more sense. There's all kinds of um, bad scientific assumptions you can make about the locations of Starbucks and the, the frequency of locations of Starbucks, right? Like, you might assume that farmers don't like to drink coffee, if you project it right. Um, that would be wrong. I think farmers probably do drink a lot of coffee. But they don't drink it at Starbucks because there are no Starbucks in rural areas, right? Because it has to have a certain population size to thrive. Uh, I don't know. Earlier iterations, they didn't have coffee. Did we do pop? We could do. We could. You had population and then the We could do the choropleth population and then. And then you overlay it. Starbucks and basically Starbucks are all in the high population counties. Right. And along the freeways and something. Yep. Oddly, like if you go back up here. It might be your dual car Yeah. There's a I like the fact that the very first Starbucks listed in this data frame is in Elizabeth City. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Elizabeth City, but and I have too. It's a nice town. It's a small town, and, you know. Okay, so I think we probably spent enough time on this, but uh, I'm happy to let you guys drive. So first question is, anybody want more time? All right, we're going to move on. Um, do you, now, the answer um, file, once again, actually answers everything that we just did, but um, 
I have different classes that want to do things differently. Some ask me to go over the answers. Some say, let's move on. So show of hands, how many people want to go over the answers? Okay, perfect. So we're going to go on to uh, corpulence. All right. Um, there are lots of kinds of maps that one could make. And we're only going to cover the XY plots and the corpulence. Um, but if you want to get into deeper, different kinds of maps, you can talk with Mark and Drew and myself later. Um, if, in case you don't know what a choropleth is, the idea behind a choropleth is that you're shading a region or an area with a variable, right? So there are some problems with choropleths. This particular choropleth um, shows wages, average wages from the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, over regions, and the regions in this case are states. Um, so the darkest blue is the highest wage. Um, one of the problems typically with choropleths is that the regional areas are not all the same, so it doesn't necessarily represent all the same population, right? So you can often have to sort of dig in a little deeper to really understand what a choropleth is trying to tell you. And as with all visualizations and all statistics, you can lie blatantly with these and create all kinds of misleading things. On the other hand, on the positive side, choropleth can tell you a lot. And in this case, it tells you, I forget exactly if this is wages for a particular um, occupation. I'm pretty certain this is, actually come to think of it, I'm pretty certain this is wages for like um, um, uh, over, uh, like overdose clinic nurses. And I don't know what exactly one is to interpret by New Jersey in this case, but um, it is clear that uh, New Jersey and California seem to have the highest wages in those cases. Um, the lowest wage places are uh, listed in yellow. And just for another point of explanation, my visualization colleague, Eric Monson, uh, tells me that, and I actually reversed the scale so that the colors would show yellow to dark blue. But he, said, he did tell me that typically in visualization, you want the brightest color to represent the highest number. I reversed it because I thought it actually was easier to interpret the other way. And it doesn't really matter because we have a scale right here, right? So there is some responsibility on the part of the person reading the visualization to figure out what we're trying to say. But just by terms of um, standards. So that's a core plan. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to use tidy census, US census. It's a, it's a R package to learn a little bit more about core plus and learn a little bit more about um, the US census. U.S. Census, sort of two things that you need to know is that the census really is at least two things. There's the decennial census that's taken every 10 years, starting from, I don't know, 1790, maybe even earlier. Um, and that's in the U.S. Constitution. And then there's the ACS census, which is relatively new. It's been going on at best 15 years, maybe not even that long. Um, and it's sample data. The other thing you need to know about uh, census um, working with census data and mapping is this concept of census geography. So let's cover both of those. So this is a decennial census. Like I said, it's done every 10 years. It's 100%. Everyone in the country, I believe it's everyone in the country. I don't know how we handle homeless people, but there's an attempt to count everybody. Um, it's used um, for creating congressional districts. It's used for other kinds of policy points. But it's just counting things. It's not particularly interesting from a social characteristics point of view. That's where the ACS comes in. Um, so the ACS is sample data. There's just a smattering of people in any given year who have to answer the, uh, don't have to, but are asked to answer the American Community Survey. And then what they do is they ask these same questions um, over a five-year run, and they do some statistical magic and try and prevent you from identifying any particular individual and then release some trend information about uh, social characteristics of people. Now, I'm guessing that nobody other than Mark and I remember, but um, back in 2000, when they didn't have the American Community Survey, they used to have this thing called the long form. So if anybody's ever filled out a census long form, which you may have filled out, you'd have a better sense of how the census works. In 2000, I got, I got the last long form, you know, the last year that they did. Is that right? I actually got them. I think we might have gotten one, too. Um, right, so there are those two different types of census. And it can be confusing because sometimes people want to know a lot of social characteristic information. And it simply does not exist in the decennial census. 
right? So you have to know where you're headed. The other thing you need to know is you need to know this concept of census geography, right? Some of these are pretty straightforward. You can get total number of people who live in the nation. There's an idea of region, there's an idea of division. States is pretty easy. You get an idea of how many people live in each state. Counties, right, are those subdivisions. Like we are not only in Durham City, but we're also in Durham County. Our neighbor to the west, Chapel Hill and Hillsborough are in Orange County, right? So you can get all that kind of information from counties. This is where I think it gets a little more confusing, but also interesting. Let's start from the bottom. A census block is a little bit like a city block, all right? I say a little bit like because that really only holds true in the case of urban areas. They have census blocks in rural areas as well, but there are no, there are no city blocks in rural areas, so it doesn't make sense. But if you think of it this way, it's, a, it's the smallest unit by which the census counts, right, census block. So if that's a city block, block groups are a little bit like a neighborhood. It's a collection of blocks. And census tracts are a little bit like a region of the city. It's a collection of block groups. So you have to identify a variable. The variable's either gonna be in the ACS or it's gonna be in the decennial census. And then you have to identify the geography or the reporting unit that you want. And you'll notice all these other colors we can kind of ignore, but there are different sort of shapes and sizes that you can report out on and the, the detail upon which you can report out sort of depends a lot on that visualization. But most of the time, we're gonna stick on the, or not all the time today, we're gonna to stick on the very high level, like total number of people in states. It's pretty easy. Um, just by way of information, this is an example of regions. So you see regions up in blue up there. Uh, the regions then are, this is a nominal notion. It doesn't, doesn't have any real importance, but there's both regions and the colors and state boundaries as the black and white. All right, so I mentioned that there's this other issue that after you identify the geography or before, you also need to identify a census variable. How many people live in X region? How many, um, you can actually get all kinds of information. How many housing units or how many householders who have an education level uh, beyond high school, all that kind of stuff. Now, to be fair, there are literally thousands of census variables. So I'm gonna open this bottom one in a new tab to give you an idea. And we're not gonna go into this in any great detail, but there's three different ways where you can read more about how to identify your census variables. Or you can send us an email. Mark in particular has an encyclopedic knowledge of the census. More, I mean, he doesn't like it when I say that, but he knows more about, that, more about the census than anybody else in the library and than a lot of other people. Um, and it just so happens that just, you know, sort of goes without saying, just because you think there's a census variable for something doesn't mean there is. So sometimes you have to find these proxies for things. Um, but just to bring that sense, that idea home, where I said there are literally thousands of census variables, this is a list of ACS variables, American Community Survey variables for 2015. And you can see, you know, this is an exhaustive list and so far I've probably not done 10%, right? So it can be a challenge to figure out the census variable you want. But I picked out a few for you. And we're gonna do that now in, oops, I wanna do it a little bit too far. I wanted to do this ggmap georef. Let's, let's go ahead and go to the choropleth and then we'll come back. Um, so we're gonna open this file, o2choropleth.rmd. And let's first run this first code chunk at line nine. Oh no, I don't have tidy census in here. Thought I, I don't. I have this problem with my. Um, oh, it hasn't been installed on that machine. Apparently not. I thought it. It works on, the, uh, on these public machines, I think. I yeah, I'm not sure. Installed. I'm not sure what I did wrong. Let me. Yeah, it's right there. Maybe I just needed to reinstall it. I mean, I mean, what I meant to say was maybe I needed to restart it. So I'm going to run this again real quickly. Again, this is a problem that only exists in this lab. You probably should not have this problem on your, on your workstation. I'm going to go over here and say session, restart R just one more time. Go over here to 
this and there we go was installed by a different version and needs to be all right one more time what in the world is happening Namespace load fail, tidy sinkage package. Wrap durs was installed by a different version. It needs to be reinstalled for use with this version. I just did that. All right, let's try reinstalling tidy senses. Oh my gosh. I don't know what to do now. I've never had this problem before. Um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to shut this down. And I'm going to open it back up. Desktop. Map. Files. Core plus. Run all. With this R version. Okay, I know what to do here. Let's see. So Murphy's law of doing live coding examples is that something's going to break. And Murphy has struck, but I am not going to let Murphy defeat our workshop. You know, what's really strange is I'm having a similar problem right here, but with a different library. Sorry? What about it? Is that something like it's not, is that there's no package called units? So, like, I felt like when it's installing the SF, the dependency units not be installed. Yeah, I don't know what that means. You could it's reinstall a units. Issue. Yeah. Yeah. It says like package SF field on the street like So when it's downloading the um Oh it's something to do with the version of your Yeah, R. like the binary source. Like the units like one of is dependent. One's dependent on, one package is dependent on another so Yeah, and yeah. the like the units itself cannot be stores. Did you try I was having him he did just like install packages. Yes, yeah, and it seemed to install, but then when he tried to do library, yeah, it, yeah. it wouldn't do it's, it. It says like it's successfully installed. Right. Um, and it's like, it's unpacked. And, like, There's some version has issue. A container I think. It's working fine on these machines. But it seems to. Um. I'm sure that we're sadly not going to be able to um, solve all the installation problems at this moment, but uh, I am happy to work with you in open office hours. Just to make sure, let me run this through. Yeah, this is working. Let me go ahead and make this up. 
larger. Okay. So run all the libraries. And then the next thing that we're doing, oh right, I need that. So you need to, this is where you need to run your um, census key if you brought it with you, all right? There are a number of ways to run the, to identify your census key. I'm gonna turn this back into a code chunk by um, putting the squirrely bracket, the curly braces. Where am I? Can you guys see what I'm seeing? No, but you can't see what I'm seeing. Sorry. There we go. So this, this block right here, a second ago, let me see if I can return it to what it was, looked like this, right? If you will put uh, braces around that, just highlight it and hit um, the uh, uh, I always want to say squiggly brackets, and you know what I mean. Curly braces, that's what technically they're called, curly braces. Just put it right there and remove the space. That'll make it an executable code chunk. And then what you're gonna do in this place where it says your API key goes here, that's the thing that you would have brought with you and it's like a whole series of crazy letters and numbers. Go ahead and put that in. Uh, without that, and the, the API key by the way is free. Without that, this won't work. The other thing you might wanna do, you can say, uh, put a comma after this and say install. Again, this is all in the documentation. Install equals true, and if you do that, it will install the key into your R environment so you never have to do it again. Um, so since this is being... Key specifically for the census stuff, right? Sorry? Specifically for the census stuff. It's specifically for the census stuff, yep. Um, so I've already done this on this machine and I don't want my key to be exposed into the recording, so I'm just gonna move on. Uh, but if you're doing that, we're, we're gonna go ahead and move on and we'll use that in just a second. So the first thing we're gonna do, actually we're gonna use it right now, is we're gonna use this get ACS function. And this is where some of the stuff we just talked about comes into account, right? County is the census geography level. So we're identifying county. And because we don't actually want county level data for the entire US, we just want it for North Carolina, right in the function NC. And in that case, a lot of times people are interested in smaller chunks of data, you can very easily um, gather the, a chunk that's more usable, right? A variable name I pulled out for you, um, and I, at one point I had that identified as to what that variable is. Um, I think it's population. Um, and then the other thing that you don't always have to do this, but if you click geometry equals true, what it will pull down is what's called a shapefile. And shapefiles, if you're used to using, um, in particular, Esri products, are those polygon shapes that you can then make uh, coroplets out of, right? So, for example, the states. Um, if you don't say geometry true, all you're getting is just the statistical variables, which is fine. Um, but if you want to make a map out of it, you have to say geometry equals true. So when I run that, the last thing I'm doing, and this is sort of a little trick, is if you then view it with this tidyverse function called as tibble, if you view ncpop, I mean you can view ncpop without the as tibble function, but it's just a little bit easier to read. Um, it throws it into this paged view, and what we're looking at then is every county name, um, the GOID, which we're not gonna use, variable name which we had identified above, right? Um, so that's just redundant. Uh, that's this right here. And then the estimate is the variable that came back. So it should be population. Um, if you spend a little more time with tidy census, you can actually rename that uh, variable name as you bring it down. So, uh, you know, it has some value. The MOE is the margin of error, which statistically speaking, we should always be working with the margin of error, but we're not today. And then this very last thing over here, that's the geometry. This is our whole collection of shape files. 
as a very weird value. It says that basically what it's telling us is that it's an S3 R data object, which quite honestly, we don't really care. You know, it's nice that it handles all of this for us, and that's all we need to know. It's just a whole collection of little lines that makes a polygon. In this case, a state shape, or a county shape, I'm sorry. Right, <clears throat> so uh, if you've ever worked with the older way of doing mapping in R, which was called SP, which I should mention, um, like one really good reason to use SF instead of SP, which we'll talk about, is that it was developed by the same person, and SP kind of got old, and it wasn't as useful in his opinion, so he rewrote it and he called it SF. So there may be some reasons why you run across SP objects and you still need to, but you shouldn't really worry about SF being the new kid on the block because it was designed to work with the tidyverse approach and it was designed to be more modern, um, and it probably does everything that you need. Um, all right, so moving on, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a core plot, and we're going to start by using this color quantile function. And what we're reading into the color quantile function is this estimate vector, right? So just to roll back up to our data frame, that's this vector right here. And what we're trying to do, I don't know if I have an example. Yeah, sure. Um, I want this collection of colors to be broken down into 10 parts. So before I do any mapping at all, I need to sort of leverage this color quantiles function to know how to create the cuts. Um, so all that's going on here in color quantile is I'm saying for the domain estimate that's in the data frame ncpop, cutting into 10 bins and using another library called Viridis, which gives me those nice yellows to greens. That's all it does. Um, I mean, you can manually set the colors to anything you want. But um, a lot of people are familiar with Color Brewer, and a lot of people may also be familiar with Viridis. They do essentially the same thing. I like Viridis a little better. Um, but uh, the value of both Viridis and Color Brewer is that they generally tend to be um, more friendly for colorblind people. And Viridis in particular is also really good for just printing straight to black and white, even though they're very brilliant colors. It turns out if you print to a black and white printer, you can still distinguish the shades very well. Um, right, so that's all that's going on there is we're setting up this function called map palette to be able to print those colors. And that happens down here. Okay, that's where we're going to reference that again. So we'll talk about that in, again in a minute. So going back to our data frame, NC pop. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to transform to a coordinate reference system by using. We're going to talk about. We'll do various examples of setting the CRS projection. In this case, this is the way you set it to this projection. Um, so I'm going to give you my very rudimentary, quick explanation of projections. They don't. You don't always have to set them, but you set projections because we're looking at two-dimensional flat representations of a globe which is round. So geometrically speaking, um, the reason why Canada looks so huge, not only is it huge, but um, the, there's a lot of space between the, the, um, to make that round surface get up to the pole. And when you flatten that out, it sort of elongates Canada disproportionately longer than it really is. Um, that's my explanation for why you need projection. It's really quite fascinating, but I'm at the same time, I don't think that that's really the point of this workshop. So just know that there are different kinds of projections that you may want to choose depending on where you're mapping. So the projection you would set for North Carolina would essentially be entirely different than the projection you might use for representing something in Australia. Okay? Um, you can look up which projection to use anywhere you want. All right, so if we just start with these three lines, we're going to get uh, almost nothing. We have a projection, and we have no base map. So the next thing that's going on here, and this answers your question earlier about setting the base map. Earlier, we were setting a base map with add tiles. So I can just run this function. I can just add those three, and I'll end up with this huge base map that we're pretty familiar with because we've looked into it um, already. Uh, has a lot of useful layers. 
but we might not want that base map. Um, so in this case, I'm using a base map called Stamen Toner Lines. Now, important question is how do you know which base map to use? So if you get the help on add provider tiles, I'm going to hit F1 here and go back. Uh, down here under Provider, there are two very nice links that essentially you can follow to find what base maps are easily available to you. And I'm going to click on one of them. Uh, and you can just sort of scroll your way through each one of these options until you find one that you like. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. Because most of these base maps that are provided through here are free but some of them are only free if you register for them, and it has to do with how APIs sort of keep track of who's using their services. Um, since they're providing you a free service, they want to know a little bit about who you are, right? And they want to make sure that you don't overwhelm their system. But there's several um, base maps on here that are completely free and don't require registration. And the largest collection of those that seems to be used broadly are the stamen versions. So this is a stamen toner and there's a nice one called um, stamen toner background. There's stamen watercolor. Not sure what you would use that for but it's pretty. There's stamen terrain. You can figure that out. Somewhere down in this list I found one called um, stamen toner lines and I kind of like it so I'm using it. So then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fill my polygons. I'm going to use the add polygons function. Fill my polygons with that um, set of quantiles in the estimate range, which I did. It's not on the screen, uh, but I did it right here at line 55. Right, so I'm clearly pulling map palette down and I'm identifying it right here and again using estimate, just being redundant. The other thing that's going on here, just so you know, uh, like we used pop-up to begin with, where with the NC Starbucks thing, we, used, we put in the pop-up just the name vector, which was very easy to use. The, the name vector was perfectly easy to read. In this particular data set called NC Pop, the name vector has like too much information in it, and so to a certain degree, I want you to ignore this, but this is just a regular expression which is defining which part of that vector I'm pulling out. You can process your vectors any way you want, so if that's confusing to you, um, you can ignore it. But essentially what I'm saying is I don't want my pop-up to say Alamance County, North Carolina. I just want it to say Alamance County. So that's all that's happening there. Um, depending on how you process your vector, you can um, you can do that anywhere you want. All right, so I'm just going to run these first bits here, leaving off the legend for a second. So this is my stainer, uh, stamen toner light background as a face map. And this is my core plate. And again, the colors are set up based on the estimate using the Beardus library. Now, we also talked about layers, so you can see that you can add a legend. Highly recommended, by the way. Like, hard to know what you're looking at without a legend. Um, and the nice thing about the leaflet map is it will define this aspect of a legend for you as well. Okay? Now, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can also do, let's just keep on going. If we read in the Starbucks data, I just want you to know that you can do similar stuff as before. Uh, so if I run this, what's going on here is I put my um, I put my Starbucks into the counties as a layer the XY plot over top of the population core plot. So that's, Mark, that goes back to that thing that you referenced earlier, that it sort of looks like um, people in rural areas don't drink Starbucks. Um, 
or it looks like corporate businesses work hard to be in population centers. Depends on how you, what, you know, how you want to tell the story, um, and what's more accurate. Right. So that's probably enough for now. Let's go ahead and hit um, exercise. I'll show you one thing, and then we're going to move back to. Uh, the third exercise. So there's this package called ggmap, which is definitely on the mapping side of um, not specifically being uh, spatial analysis. In that, in, at least from my opinion, now you can extend ggmap a long way, and if you know ggplot. Um, it will help you use ggmap without too much effort um, in that a lot of the layering and the connection, the connector with the plus symbol is the same. Uh, and you can definitely use ggmap to make some interesting layers, but what I think it's exceptionally good at is just making sort of quick, simple, static maps, right? So uh, since that is actually a use case that sometimes shows up because people need to either put them in a publication or make a poster. Uh, we're just going to cover it real quickly. I'm going to read in the Starbucks data like I did before. And we're going to limit down to North Carolina. And what you'll note, what I want you to note, I'm actually going to go back over to, to the uh, to this website under plot coordinates static map to show you this is what people were doing basically you could say something like get map Durham North Carolina and set the zoom level um, and then under map type the easiest thing to do was to use one of the known variables for Google Maps right so terrain satellite road map or hybrid and then you would get something like this and then you could overlay heat maps or um, XY plots or whatever on top of that. It was a very good way to get a quick static map, which I think of for use in some kind of publication or printed thing, right? A lot of what we've been doing is we've been using Leaflet, which has a very nice interactive layer to it. But in order <coughs> to share that with others, you need to send them an HTML file, which is not hard, or mount it on the web, which is moderately more complicated. Um, but this is sort of a different use case. Now, sadly, uh, Google completely rewrote their API about eight months ago. And so in order to do this, you can still do it, but you have to go through some of Google's documentation on APIs. And while that is not hard, it's probably more tedious than it is um, trivial. Like it's just, you just gotta read a bunch of documentation. You have to put in a credit card number that they never end up using. They basically give you this huge amount of free credits it's all just to make sure that you don't run amok. So you can still do this if you want a Google map. Um, but the easiest thing to do now is just to switch over to something like Stamen Maps. So since we're talking about publications, we're going to use a, I'm going to show you a Stamen Map example. The nice thing about Stamen Maps, really, in my mind, is that they're exceptionally good contrast for black and white. All right. So um, what you're doing here in Stamen, and what is different is that you have to identify a bounding box by latitude and longitude. You can check the, direct, uh, the documentation under, um, under location for get map. Um, but prior to that, if you did have the Google API set up, you could just put in something like Burlington, North Carolina, and it would give you back a natural bounding box for Burlington. You could set the zoom. But in this case, you have to just be a little bit more prescriptive and identify your bounding box and then the other things that's happening is we're setting uh, the source equal to stamen. There are several other sources. And the map type equal to toner. Now, once again, I just want to highlight this. If you look in the documentation on, that's on board for get map, and you go down here to source, it will tell you which sources you can use. And if you go down to map, map type, it will tell you which map types work for which sources. You can't really make those variables up, but they're easy to gather. Um, and then in the last example, we even saw an example of how you can extend that out with additional base maps. Right? So 
everything I'm going to do here, first I'm going to identify the map box and I'm just going to put that uh, vector in here so it's a little easier to read. I'm going to put all that from get map into an object and then the main command is just ggmap and I'm identifying this object as this object just to make it easy to see. And what I end up there with there is that stamen map that you just saw a minute ago with the toner, high contrast, black and white. Um, and an example of how you can extend it with the ggmap, uh, ggplot-like syntax is I'm adding this g on point layer on top of that. Um, so I can look at my Starbucks example again. And I have control over what the what the points look like and how big they are. In this case, they're red. Um, and then I can also, just like you can with all, with all ggplot stuff, I can affect the theme a bit. If I run that whole program again, um, I'm going to take out, I think I'm taking out, yeah, I'm taking out the latitude and longitude, and I'm taking out these x and y labels. Um, and if you want to learn more about ggplot, you can. But right there is, you know, something that you could imagine would more easily fit into a uh, publication that you're submitting. All right, but moving along, let's pick up thematic mapping. And before I get too far along on this, go back here to my slide. So choroplasts are a form of thematic mapping. Um, is there anything on this slide that I really want you to know? Some of this we've already talked about. SF is a is a predator, is a uh, successor to SP, and it's very easy to co coerce the data object back and forth. Um, and this link will actually tell you how to do that. Um, there's some nice vignettes, uh, and another thing that's actually pretty handy is that you can read and write shape files in the raw with these two functions. So if you're getting a hold of shape files in a way different from what we just did, right? We just used tidy census to pull them down and it managed all that for us. But people get their shape files from a lot of sources. One is to ask Mark or send a note to ask data. Um, we're going to use a package here in a second called Tigris, which is a cousin to tidy census but doesn't require um, an API key. It doesn't do as much as tidy census, but what it does do pulls down shape files. If you had to share those shape files with somebody else who wasn't doing the same computational, uh, wasn't, didn't have the same computational style as you, maybe, maybe they're working in Python, maybe they're working in um, ArcGIS, just need to share the shape files, you might do something like this where you write out your shape files and then share them and then they can do their own analysis. But basically in terms of workflow for uh, thematic mapping, we're going to use Tigris to pull a shape file. We're going to get some data from somewhere else. In this case, Bureau of Labor Statistics data has nothing to do with the census. Uh, we're going to have to adjoin those. Um, the example that I'm using, actually here, this slide needs to be updated. Um, it's using the function uh, uh, append data, which is part of the TMAP library. But you can actually use the deplier library, left join does the same thing. Um, and that's what we're going to do in our example. And then lastly, we're going to visualize we're going to focus on the ggplot visualization with the function geomsf, which works naturally with the SF library. But there are some others here that are actually far simpler to use, um, but you have a little less control over the final product. So let's just, let me just see if I can show you what I mean by far simpler to use, and then we'll quickly move on. Right, so over here, thematic mapping, tmap. Right. Uh, so if you, man if you wrangle all your data and get what you need, you can actually just send your, uh, your data frame that has polygons in it, has shape files in it. You can just send it to QTM, and you can see that it will automatically develop your color ramp. It'll develop your labels. Um, in this case, it's doing the whole of the U.S., and because the U.S. territories actually expand a huge amount of the globe, um, it's not a particularly attractive map. 
Um, so of course you have to do a little bit more wrangling. Like in this case, we're filtering out. We're saying we don't want Region 9. We looked at those census regions earlier. Uh, we don't want Alaska. We don't want Hawaii. Um, and we get, here's a good example of a perfectly fine map that's unprojected. So um, TM shape, which is a T map function, did all this with minimal effort. It came up with the, the breaks and it came up with the color scheme and it's very readable. The only thing I don't like about this is the projection, right? This flat line across the top is a dead giveaway, but it's not projected very well because that's not what the United States really looks like. And projection is a big thing in GIS. So I just want you to note that there's a way to set your transforms using a different projection. That's the syntax for it. And there you get a more natural shape uh, which people prefer, seem to prefer. All right, so we're going to move on to close this and close this. And I want 032 thematic mapping. I'm going to run all these libraries. And the next function we're going to run is from Tigris. That's this right here. And it is um, using the states function to pull down all of the US state polygon shapes, the shape files. And by default now, we're calling it uh, class SF. If you uh, don't have SF working, you could put class SP in there, and it might work. So now we have this shape file, US Geo. Um, if we look at that real quickly, uh, these kind of shape files that, and in this case, come from the census are full of a whole lot of metadata that we don't particularly care about, like the region and the division and the state code and all that, even the um, Postal Service state code. But what we do care about is this, this thing right here, the shape which is referred to as the geometry. Um, so that's the reason why we did this, so we could get the shape. And then over here, uh, I pulled down some BLS data that I described above, how I grabbed that, and basically end up with a two variable data frame that has area name, which we're gonna have to munge a little bit because we don't want these codes. And it has, um, else in there, annual mean wages. So if we keep wrangling that, uh, we end up with renaming some stuff, fixing the names, putting it in a data frame called BLS join, and having a look. This is where we're doing our left join. All right, so what we're joining is GS, USGO, which is, has our shape files, and we're joining it to BLS wage, right? And we're joining it by name equals state. So I think in USGO, if we look at it, uh, here's name right here. This is, by the way, I always hate this. Like, the worst way to do a join is, is alphanumerically. Like, if you, could, if you could join on a code, you'd be way better, on numeric code, you'd be way better off, but in this case, we didn't have it. And we're gonna join that to BLS wage, and so this is where state name equals the name of ESGO. And what we end up with is a slightly bigger table that has, and all, the only reason why we did this at all is so that we could have this geometry in the right spot with this wage number filter out those regions that we don't want to show up in our visualization. And then here's the, um, here's the code that actually allows us to visualize it with ggplot, right? So everything we did up until that point was just data wrangling to the states. Now we're gonna ggplot where we're filling and color. Color and fill are, um, let's see, fill is the internal part of the polygon and color is gonna be the border around it. We're setting it to the same variable, 
um, using GMSF, setting the projection once again, and in this case, creating our color ramp with Viridis. Um, and this will generate uh, hopefully a pretty nice map. What's it waiting on? There it is. So um, since it is in ggplot, there's a lot more you can do to get rid of these or Altner, you can see the lat lines and the, and the gray scale and the legend and all those things can be managed. And if you look deeper into the documentation I'm sharing, you're welcome to manage that. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about doing all this in R is that you have a lot of fine grain control. The downside of doing it in R is that you have to attend to the fine grain control, otherwise you're not going to get a map. So. And that's, that's the cases where, like, I don't, if you don't really want to attend to it, use something like TMAP and the QTM function that I just briefly went over. Um, there are lots of ways to make choropleths. Um, these are just two examples. So <clears throat> given that, I'm going to suggest now that you, so here's the really free form part, right? The last exercise, exercise three, doesn't actually have any answers. So I'm going to invite you to do those while I'm around. Um, if you've had enough, give me some feedback on the post-its and put them up on the door as you're on your way out. Um, if you have specific questions, I can try and answer them now. What I usually say to people is these workshops are good for giving a broad overview, but really horrible for a particular project. And if you're really going to learn this stuff, you need to engage with a particular project. So please come see me Wednesdays 1 to 3, set up an appointment, go see Mark. We are more than happy to make this relevant to your project, uh, but in a, in a workshop setting is often difficult to do. Um, but I appreciate your attention, I appreciate you coming, and that is the end of the workshop. So thanks so much. Thank you.